Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Lily Weitzman, and I am a programming librarian at the Public Library of Brookline. Today we will be talking with Andrew Buckley about his film Stefano and taking audience questions. This program is brought to you by a partnership between Brookline Interactive Group and the Public Library of Brookline. Before we begin, let's take a moment to acknowledge the history of this land we call Brookline. This is the unceded land of the Massachusetts people whose traditions, language, and stewardship continue today through their descendants, the Massachusetts tribe of Ponkapog. We acknowledge the continuing presence of the Massachusetts as well as the neighboring Wampanoag and Nipmuc peoples. And now let's begin. Um, Andrew, I'll invite you to introduce yourself and I will invite everyone watching at home. Uh, you are invited to send in your questions. If you are watching on YouTube or Facebook, you can type in comments. And if you are watching on TV, you are welcome to send us an email at crew at brooklineinteractive.org. So Andrew, I'll hand it over to you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm Andrew Buckley. I am the uh, creator and host of Hit and Run History, which is a public media uh, series that follows different stories throughout history, um, uh, usually with a travel element to them. Uh, we started off following the Columbia Expedition, which is the first American voyage around the world uh, that left Boston in 1787. We're still continuing to follow that story. Um, however, uh, our latest installment uh, was this single episode, uh, the 90-minute film, Stefano, the True Story of Shakespeare's Shipwreck. Uh, we operate out of Cape Cod, and this particular film was made in partnership with the Cape Media Center and Rhode Island PBS. Great. Um, so I'll start off just by asking, how, how does a piece like this get made? What's the process of <laughs> something like this coming together? Well, a, a lot of what we do, I have to say, is um, ad hoc uh, and, and informal. Um, I have a, a developed a, a, a nice network of people down on the Cape, especially, um, and uh, with, with certain skills. Usually when we go out, we have a crew of ideally five, which is myself as the host, um, uh, two camera people, uh, and one on sound, and a still photographer, because typically any place we go, there's wonderful images. Uh, so with that team put together, uh, it's really just where do we aim? Where do we aim ourselves? What story do we uh, uh, go with? But in this particular case, um, I was getting ready uh, a few years ago um, to take a cruise on the Norwegian Dawn out of Boston to go to Bermuda. Uh, I happened to mention to somebody at uh, Mass uh, Humanities that I was going to be doing this, and well, you know, I might turn up some information on my ancestor, Stephen Hopkins, who supposedly was shipwrecked on Bermuda. Maybe I might find something there on the two and a half days that the ship is there. And um, that was enough to get them intrigued to encourage me to apply for a pre-production grant, which we did. And we were awarded a, a $10,000 pre-production grant for Mass Humanities. Um, and that was just to, supposed to pay for a fundraising trailer. Um, our fundraising trailer ended up being seven minutes long. We went up and down the eastern seaboard. I, kind of, I could have probably made most of the film just from that footage. And, uh, uh, and from there, we were just kind of off to the races because uh, we got more support. Uh, Cape Air uh, also uh, lent us uh, some uh, funds, or not lent us, uh, donated some funds uh, as an underwriter for uh, post-production work, and the timing with the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the Mayflower seemed to be just about right. If not for COVID, uh, we would have had a very busy year, as many people down in that area would, would have. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's basically how it is. But uh, we, were, we just gathered information from all over, and uh, we had a really good time. That's great. And that actually leads really well into our first audience question. Um, so our question is, how long did the research and production for this project take? So research and production. Well, um, usually it, it takes us, we, we, that was about a year of uh, getting everything together, gathering information, figuring out who our sources were going to be. I mean, a year is probably generous. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up with a lot of this information, 
And the thing is, when you pick up a book about this, you often are able to see who the sources are, some of whom might still be alive. And in this particular case, uh, Caleb Johnson, the genealogist uh, that we met while he was in England, um, I actually got in touch with him beforehand, told him I was going to be going to England, and he said, well, I'm going to be going on a research trip there. And so he decided to go at the same time that we were going to be there. So that was, that was pure serendipity. Um, and you know, one resource leads to another, and uh, usually people are more than happy to talk about their local history as well. So you know, we, we approach this in many ways as a procedural. So rather than starting off, in fact, one person who was doing some editing said, uh, okay, I'm going to be doing the editing, um, where's the script? And I said, we don't have a script. We don't know where we're going to end up at the end of the day because it, we, follow, we go wherever the story fall, uh, you know, allows us to go as long as we have the people in the, in the car with the cameras and the, and the sound equipment. And so it's, you know, we go wherever the evidence leads us. Um, and, and so oftentimes we're learning along the way. That was actually going to be my, one of my questions <laughs> was, um, you know, how much are you adapting and changing plans throughout? And it seems like always, constantly. always, um, it makes for a great story, but it makes for a hell of a editing process because, as one of our videographers said, you know, it, it's this film was a monster. We had so much information. I could have done uh, you know, an eight or nine hour Ken Burns multi-night documentary on this if we had just had enough time. Um, but as it is, it, it comes down to we had to fit it into, first we were trying for an hour long and then we realized we, we were going to blow past that and so we tried to squeeze you know, 10 gallons into a five gallon hat uh, for an hour and a half. And that's, and that's what we have here. In fact, the, this version is not the regular PBS broadcast version. This has two minutes of bonus material. And so, um, and you know, we could, we could do more. The, the interview that we had with Bernard Cornwell was 26 minutes of pure gold. I could have taken just that and, and said, there, there's our half hour thing on Stephen Hopkins. And, and people would have been perfectly happy with that. And, and I may still do that. <laughs> More bonus features. Yes, exactly. Yes. Lots of bonus clips. Yep. Um, on a similar note, because um, the question was about research, how much, mm. like, what types of research are you doing? You, you know, you're obviously talking to a lot of people. Are you also doing a lot of like primary source? Yeah, I mean, uh, when, when you're talking about things related to the Mayflower, that there's just so much, um, and uh, it's it's really sifting through. Um, stuff that is legend versus stuff that is true. Um, a lot of it was handed down, and I have to say that the, the stuff that was handed down, I'll call it oral history in my family, um, was accurate. Um, and also, uh, it, so that was helpful, but at the same time, um, there's a lot of information. There, there's just, people have gone over this for you know, the better part of two centuries. Um, so there was that. There's a lot of scholarship uh, in the same way um, for, sh for Shakespeare, a lot of historical work. Um, I spoke with a dramaturge um, from uh, 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 Shakespeare in the Park in New York uh, and talked about the Tempest there. So I mean, there, there are a lot of phone calls um, and it was really, you know, you learn a lot by talking to the academics themselves. And so we kind of, and we would read up a little bit. It, it makes it makes an interview better if you go in with asking informed questions because you get better answers rather than just going in completely blind. So um, you know, it usually would be either I'd be a, 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 actually a great source was Google Docs. I have to say, uh, not Google Docs, but um, the Google Google Books yep. um, and such. And so um, being able to look at things from you know 150 years ago, 200 years ago. Reading that, the um, you know, reading the original Mayflower Compact, uh, that sort of thing. Um, unfortunately, there are some gaps in the historical record that just can't be filled, um, and so we kind of have to guess, or we have to kind of figure out what other sources can help us piece things together a little bit. So, another really good segue. All of these things that are oh. coming up that I had wanted to ask about, because um, I had also been thinking about historical record in the context of this and. You know, as you said, you know, things 
topics like the Mayflower are going to be heavily recorded. Right. What was there anything that sort of surprised you in like something that was well recorded that you hadn't expected? And on the other side, like what were those gaps? Well, I can say that the the the, the gap that was the most painful and frustrating was Jamestown. Um, the Virginia Company records really don't exist. And so trying to find any record of what Stephen Hopkins was doing while in Jamestown, it just doesn't exist anymore. And the, the thing that really blew our minds when we did go to Jamestown, and we did that filming um, that horrible, horrible winter about five or six years ago, um, it, you could see it, when mm -hmm. we you could see the yep. footage from Plymouth Plantation where it was just all snow. I'm sure that everybody would have loved to see Plymouth Plantation all green and and lush and everything, but no, we were going for winter, and we got winter. Um, when we were down there, the same thing. It was it was very very cold down there, and uh, but still we walked out and we realized it just wasn't anything there. Um, Jamestown had gotten so abandoned that they didn't even know where it was. I can go to Plymouth and walk down the same streets that Stephen Hopkins and William Bradford and all the rest did, um, but you know, Jamestown was just a farmer's field. Somewhere along, you know, they, they hadn't identified it until very recently. All that got lost and it just kind of blew our minds that um, that had never been kept. And so we felt that the best way to be able to fill in that gap was to talk about Pocahontas, because that was really the thing going on at the time, and that does segue very well. Because he, if he was uh, still continue, continuing as the clerk to the minister there, uh, Stephen Hopkins would have been present, possibly participating in the ceremony of her wedding, and it's very likely that he was on the same vessel that she was on when she went to England. So there's a connection there, and it and it shows that it's it. it it, it t helps us tell a broader story rather than getting into the minutia of what was Stephen Hopkins eating, you know, while he was there, or how many times did he have to go to church. We kind of figured that out. It was basically he was living under martial law, and it was dreadful, you know, f several years of that. <laughs> um, so why don't we go to another um, question from a viewer, and you are welcome, um, everyone at home, to continue sending in questions. This is, what did you find was the most difficult aspect of shooting internationally, and were there any challenges that impacted production? So we talked a little bit about you know, oh. filming here in the winter. What about internationally? Um, yeah, when, uh, usually when we film, and we filmed in more difficult locations than England, um, certainly. Um, but uh, when we were there, it was simply the fact is we, we look like a group of tourists. We do not have giant cameras. You know, usually it's, um, you know, there was a, uh, small video camera, digital SLRs, um, our phones, um, and so we have an incredibly light footprint. So the most challenging thing for us really was the fact is that when filming in Bermuda, um, their laws say that you have to have somebody, um, a member of the crew, m you must hire somebody locally, which is great because you know it, it's a small island, mm -hmm. uh, lots of places want to film there, and they just want to make sure that you just don't have outside film crews come in, film something, and there is absolutely no benefit at all. Um, so, so we hired uh, Jason Lowe to um, while we were there, and that that way we were able to uh, interview the historians while we were there. And to be honest, um, you know, Jason brought along a, a a very high quality video camera, and uh, and so it was it was that was a real benefit to us. Plus, um, he's the one who took us to go get those fish sandwiches. Uh, <laughs> and so I'd say the most challenging thing about that was trying to finish that sandwich because it was, it was enormous. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, I would say that Bermuda was the toughest, but other than that, uh, everything went pretty easily. And uh, when we were in Plymouth, England, um, we got great participation there. So because we were actually in Plymouth on Thanksgiving, Plymouth, England, and so that, that kind of made things really interesting, especially because Chris Wessling, who was a member of the Wampanoag tribe, took part in their Thanksgiving ceremonies. Can you describe that a little bit more? That sounds oh, I very know. And, and it's, and, yeah, it, it, and it was tricky for us to be able to do. Uh, we got a lot of footage from there, 
but it was one of those things that we can't, you know, it didn't fit into our particular story. However, the fact that, um, you know, that it clearly, you know, uh, nobody in England is celebrating American Thanksgiving except for uh, Plymouth, England. And so, you know, they, they draw a lot of people there. They have a um, they have the, the Mayflower Steps, they have um, uh, a, a ceremony that takes place and then a parade that goes up. In fact, there, we did take part of the parade footage there, but Chris was in his um, full uh, Wampanoag regalia um, and was marching down the, at the head of the parade with the Lord Mayor. Um, and we did have an interview with the Lord Mayor as well. And so, I mean, again, we've got, we've got that. And, it's, and it really was interesting because people in England especially, we're showing great appetite for the Native American perspective of the story. There's a lot of, uh, I, I, we've seen a lot of sensitivity to that. I'm going to be going um, to England uh, and doing some uh, screenings there. And there is, again, people are really interested in the fact that we bring a lot of the Native, Native American perspective into the story um, that otherwise, you know, they're, they're they're kind of familiar with, um, but it, it just gives a different angle to it. So I think I think that's the thing is there was a lot of interest. So I think that also leads well into another question um, from a viewer: um, How did you ensure that you were telling the most accurate story and giving voice to those whose stories are not traditionally focused on, given that history is shaped by the victors? Well, in this particular case, um, before I even started filming. Uh, I knew that Paula Peters, who was in the film, a um, uh, member of the Wampanoag tribe, filmmaker, journalist, and uh, I knew that she had done a film um, called 1614. It was a short film um, about the kidnapping of Squanto when, you know, the, in, in 1614. Um, my daughter and I went to the Plymouth Public Library where she was doing a screening of that and uh, watch the film featuring Chris Wessling playing Squanto in the film. And so, um, and I didn't, I had never met Chris at all. And so uh, I got up and I spoke with her afterwards and I told her what I was planning on doing, but I really wanted to have this perspective. And so we arranged that I was going to interview her. And she said to me, in turn, uh, would you like to interview the young man who played Squanto? I said, absolutely. So we interviewed him as well, um, and then at the end of the interview I said, we're going to be taking this 50 mile walk from Plymouth um, to Warren, Rhode Island that Winslow Hopkins had done with Squanto, do you want to come along? And Chris said, oh absolutely, I can put on the skins and everything. I said, no, 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 we, you can wear your regular street clothes. Uh, we're, not, we're not doing a reenactment, we're just retracing it. And so he joined us for that. And so, and, and so having Chris along, being able to tell the Tory story of Squanto and giving that perspective. That's, that did a lot along with the interviews um, that we had with Paula Peters. So the first person to watch the completed version of this film, I sat down at the Cape Media Center conference room with my laptop and Paula Peters and I asked her to watch it. And I just sat there quietly while she watched the whole thing. And what she said to me afterward is that was very well done very balanced and you should be very proud. As far as I'm concerned, <laughs> that's, that's who I needed to, to, to pass muster with. Great. Um, changing tracks just a little bit, um, one of the things that I was thinking about you know, watching the film and also in what you were just saying about you know, taking the, the 50 mile walk um, is just how much history and how many historic places are still sort of here around. Um, you know, obviously everywhere, but since you know there's a regional connection, I wondered if there were any particular places that really um, struck you, um, you know, in this region as somewhere to visit, as places that are worthwhile to see. Yeah, I, I think that I mean, um, going through Middleborough uh, was really interesting because uh, when they're tracing this, uh, uh, when they're taking this walk. Um, it becomes clear as we are doing it and trying to retrace the steps that Squanto is kind of taking them halfway and then kind of a roundabout way. Uh, and they believe that it's, it's believed that he was trying to, you know, 
muddle it so that they wouldn't be able to do it without him be able to, you know, because he was like, well, of course, if I bring them one time and I bring them the most fastest direct route, that means they'll have, they'll know exactly how to get to, um, get to Massasoit as quickly as possible. So let's kind of go this roundabout way. Um, but being able to see all those places that they're talking about um, and the beauty of the place, uh, still, you know, it, it's in, in Middleborough, it's, it's still rural. Um, you're still seeing these fields. Um, it's still the same little crossings of creeks and things like that. And I think that was, uh, you know, that was a very cool thing. But it's just, in, in, in the greater perspective, when we're making a film, um, it's important to us to be able to show that you, know, you can find history in all sorts of everyday places if you just kind of know where to look for them. And that's what we're doing is just constantly stumbling over it here and there and, and you know, not even realizing it until we turn around and there's a statue of someone we were just talking about 15 minutes ago. Oh my God, he, this guy that nobody ever heard of and now you know, there he is. Um, you know, that sort of thing. And also um, because we have travel element to this and we're constantly around the water, um, you know, a lot of coastlines, you know, downtown Boston, coastlines change quite a bit, but places out on the Cape or things um, haven't. And so you can kind of get a feel for a place. That, that beach where um, Jamie Horton is reading the uh, account of the wreck itself, it was important for us to put him reading that on that very beach. Except for the fortress that was behind him, everything else was exactly the same. I want to make sure we have a chance to talk about the Tempest and the oh, uh, yeah. connection <laughs> to the Tempest. <laughs> yeah. um, there's so many different like components to this film. Um, so, you know, was there anything? You know, how did making this film impact how you view the Tempest? Was there anything that it sort of illuminated or, or shed perspective on? Yeah, I, I, I think it's it's really interesting to be able to. Um, Look at it. Uh, 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 it's interesting that it's that the Tempest is called a comedy um, when there's a love story and there's you know there's all sorts of other things going on here um, and there's you know, there are multiple stories happening at the same time. But you know if you're going to call it a comedy, then you really have to think about the comedy. The core of the comedy of this play is that interaction between uh, Tranquilo, Stefano, and Caliban. Um, so being able the thing that's really interesting is to see the so many different interpretations. Um, I've never seen any performance of The Tempest where Caliban looks the same. He's al always, somebody always has a very broad interpretation of what that character looks like. Uh, Trinculo is always some sort of, you know, he's a jester, he's a clown. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's, you can dress a clown a bunch of different ways, but he's still a clown. Um, and then, and then Stefano is, you know, just kind of every man. Um, so it, it's really interesting to see that interaction, and uh, and the comedy still comes forth. People, you know, four hundred years later, are still laughing at this play, um, and it's that part of it that, that that they're laughing at. So I I think it's really interesting to see the interpretations of those interactions and how people uh, people people uh, manipulate that. I, I also think it's kind of funny because if Stephen Hopkins had a background in, you know, with, as a tavern keeper and such, and he's supposed to be, the, you know, the um, uh, Stefano is the butler, but that comes from bottler, in other words, someone who serves your alcohol, and so, uh, and he floats ashore on a, on a butt of sack, which is a cask of sherry and just spends the rest of the time just drinking from it. So I mean, it's, it's interesting to be able to see that interaction um, between him and, and Caliban um, uh, as well and, and the, the influences there. So it, it, it's just, you, we kept on, it's, there's so many m layers to this that you can just continue to, to peel away at it and find more interpretations. Yeah. It's interesting too that you know, this, you know, supposedly the most comedic plot line also has these very serious oh, undertones yeah. too. Yeah, I mean it's 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 funny. Yeah. It's also disturbing and creepy, and uh, lots of different overtones to it. And um, again, we've seen so many interpretations as to uh, um, you know what these relationships really are, and also what they. It it's uh, it's a lot about the frontier, 
And so, uh, you know, one of the one of the first things that is on a frontier is a tavern where people gather from many different backgrounds. And so, later on, Stephen Hopkins was um, the tavern keeper in Plymouth. He was and getting into trouble for serving alcohol to the wrong people on the wrong days for the wrong prices uh, and such. And so, you know, that it, it was almost like what happened in the Tempest could be considered happening later on you know I, uh, you know life imitates art art imitates life and and then it continues on again the the, the constant replay of that and so um, uh, yeah I, I could go on and on about that but it's just the fact is that you have a, a tavern is a place for the mixing of, of different peoples and uh, and I think that's kind of at the heart of it and we have time for maybe one or two questions more. Um, I, I did want to ask, you know, what was the experience like with this particular story, you know, as a descendant of Hopkins? You know, because there's that yeah. very personal familial component to it. Oh, um, I mean, it was it, the one thing I wanted to make sure that um, you know, my mother, uh, uh, Lucy Buckley, is is. 91 and I wanted to make sure that I got it done so that she would be able to see it <laughs> um, and uh, and in fact it's um, she is at a nursing home in down in Orleans right now um, not very far from where she grew up on Hopkins Lane in East Orleans uh, yeah and <laughs> she um, and in fact she was born in they didn't even have a midwife in Orleans when she was born uh, that you had to go to the next town over and the midwife's house is right next to the um, cemetery that holds Giles Hopkins, Stephen Hopkins' son, and Constance Snow, his daughter. And so that's how close that is. So on um, October 2nd, uh, we're going to be at the Snow Library showing the film, and I want to make sure that my mother is able to see that. So, so that was important to me on the one hand. The other thing is it was... I just wanted to know what was going on. This this film could have easily been, you know, my white ancestor worship, you know, and and I didn't want it to be that because that's the never the way it was presented to me. It was always presented as a story that Stephen Hopkins was different. He was he was one of the strangers, one of the leaders of the strangers. There was the saints and the strangers on the Mayflower, and he was not one of the congregation. He was from another place. He had a different background. He had it's he had kind of gotten into trouble before and he was coming along so he had a, something different to offer and he was kind of getting into trouble because he had a big mouth but he but that doesn't mean that necessarily he was wrong and you know, maybe just he was wrong in the way of saying it and so the thing is that I was seeing I was seeing some family traits that were familiar uh, but I just wanted to know what was real and what wasn't. And I had a feeling that there were some stories here that were, were really interesting. And the thing that really got me was when, when I'm putting together a story like this, one of the things that helps me is to put together a timeline. I wanted to know where Stephen Hopkins was at particular times. Okay, so where was Pocahontas at these particular times? Where was, um, where was John Smith? In other words, how many times did some of these notable people cross paths? And if, you can only do that by putting it together. And that's when we started to realize that Pocahontas, Guano, and Stephen Hopkins were probably all in London at the same time, probably within, you know, blocks of each other. And that is a fascinating idea. Um, and it's a perspective that people don't think about that this was happening in London before the Mayflower even took off from England. There were things going on there. It wasn't just like the Mayflower arrived and, you know, blank slate. It's fascinating, yeah. and yeah, and I think just you know the way that the story is framed, you know, with Stephen Hopkins sort of as the I don't know, like as the through line, but used to examine yeah. all of these different. He's aspects. a vehicle. Yeah. He's he he may be the subject, but really this isn't. When we tell our stories, it's we're not following the story of Stephen Hopkins. You're following us, following the story of Stephen Hopkins because it tells us about. It gives us a better idea of what really was going on during that very early colonial period of um, Atlantic exchange. So, and shows that, you know, if nothing else, it shows, you know, Native Americans were in England 
uh, before a lot of Europeans were in North America. That's really important, and that's a perspective that I think people don't have. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we are just about finishing up. Is there yeah. any sort of um, additional thoughts, last um, thoughts for today that you'd like to leave us with about oh. the, the film? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I can just say that um, we're really having a very good time um, uh, talking with audiences about this film. Um, it broadcast on Rhode Island PBS earlier this year. They're going to uh, program it again for October. Um, there are other PBS stations that are going to be putting it on as well. I'm going to be going across the country and showing it. And I think, you know, every time I, uh, but live events um, you know, like this where I can interact, I learn a lot from questions. Um, it really informs me, and uh, and and I and I enjoy that. And then we put it back. You know, the, the, it shows up on our social media feeds for Hit and Run History, and so. Um, but we really we enjoy this because it's part of the learning process. And and the one thing we try to do is we don't try to be the last word on a subject. We realize we're probably more the first word, and so if this sends people to the internet, to the library, <laughs> to look up yeah. more. There's, there's all sorts of information out there, um, and uh, we hope we're sparking, you know, uh, especially young minds to, uh, to, to look deeper into things and, and realize that, you know, history isn't something that's just in a book. It, you may just be walking down the streets past something that, that's significant. You don't realize it. So um, the only other thing I do want to say, though, is thank the um, uh, Brookline Commission for the Arts for the grant that made this all possible in the first place. So um, uh, uh, props to them. <laughs> Great, and I wanted to say thank you to you, Andrew, for joining us, um, and thank you to everyone for tuning in and for sending in your questions. Um, we hope you enjoyed this program and enjoyed learning about this little part of history that connects to so many other parts of histories. Um, this program today is brought to you by a partnership between Brookline Interactive Group and the Public Library of Brookline. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful evening.